it's a pleasure for me now to introduce our first keynote speaker. Our first keynote speaker at the at this conference is Ottmar Edenhofer. Uh, I'm sure many of you know him. Ottmar Edenhofer is one of the world's leading scholars on the economics uh, and politics of climate change. Um, let me still say a few words to introduce him. Uh, Ottmar Edenhofer is director and chief economist of the Potsdam Institute uh, for Climate Impact Research, as well as director of the Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change. He's also professor on the economics of uh, climate change at the Technical University in Berlin. Ottmar Edenhofer has published uh, numerous articles in leading journals, including Science, uh, PNAS, Nature, Climate Change, and many others, also leading economics journals, uh, like the Journal of Environmental Economics and Management. Uh, now, like uh, all of us, um, the keynote speakers had to change and adjust their planned uh, speeches and presentations. Uh, and so did Otmar, so the title uh, of his keynote uh, is uh, Pigou in the post-corona era. And I'm very much looking forward to this presentation. So welcome, uh, Otmar, thanks for accepting this. Uh, and the floor is yours. Again, it's a great honor. And what I would like to do is uh, in this presentation is uh, to give a tribute on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the publication of the economics of welfare. So basically, it's the one of the Piguvian text highlighted in the economics of welfare exactly 100 years ago. And if you read the, the text of Pigou, it has two important components. The first uh, proposition is if marginal private benefits are lower than social benefits, there's too little production and a subsidy is needed. And in the opposite case, a tax is needed, and then we refer to the optimal Begubian tax that maximizes welfare. And despite uh, Coase, there is a theoretical consensus that Begubian taxes are a good idea, and some believe Begubian taxes are a very good idea. And there's a diverse group of supporters of Begubian taxation, ranging from Joseph Stieglitz, Niklas Stern, Bill Nordhaus, Greg Mankiw, and Milton Friedman. And all of them arguing that not paying the costs of the damage to the environment, it's a, a, a subsidy, just as not paying the full costs of workers would be. And this is, again, the same, same argument. And Greg Menke argues that uh, he is a strong believer in, in Begubian taxation. And in addition to that, his argument is it's just an educational issue for the public and for the uh, policymakers. The next gentleman I would like to refer here is, it's probably not perceived as an economist, but even in his environmental encyclical Laudato Si, Pope Francis highlighted uh, the principle of the social costs and the Begubian taxation as an ethical principle uh, that uh, activities on the market can only be considered as ethical when all the social costs are taken into account. So there is a diverse group of supporters of the Begubian taxation. And the question is, why is there are doubts of the political viability of the Begubian taxation? Uh, in this lecture, I will use the term Begubian taxation in the following sense. With taxation, I refer to direct pricing in contrast to indirect pricing via emissions trading. A price caller, for example, is subsumed under direct pricing schemes, so hybrid systems uh, can be designed in a way uh, that which is very similar to direct pricing. In what follows in this uh, keynote, I will defend two claims. The first claim is there are sound theoretical reasons for calling the visibility of Begubian taxation into question. And secondly, uh, this consensus is somewhat spurious in, this, in, in that the political success of Begubian taxation is higher than a single-minded focus on the reasons uh, I will elaborate in uh, point one would suggest. Now, the sound part of the consensus, what are the reasons for the difficulties of the implementing, uh, of implementing the Begubian taxation? And uh, I have highlighted uh, six reasons. The first one is the enormous uncertainties about the marginal benefits, in particular, the social costs of carbon. 
for example, within the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, most economists argue that social costs of carbon are probably not a reasonable device for policymakers due to these huge uncertainties. The second objection might be the regressive distributional impacts on poor households. Many policymakers, when they are advised to put a carbon price uh, uh, on emissions, uh, they immediately respond that uh, they are afraid of the regressive distributional impacts. The third aspect is more a political one. The fragmented responsibilities of ministries countries lead to excessive focus on sector-specific policies and or uh, technology policies. The fourth argument, there are commitment problems. So when there is a a unified carbon price across all the sectors. If policymakers in an ideal world would be committed to a price path, uh, investors would form stable expectations and they would invest uh, according to the marginal abatement costs. But when there is no commitment, so then there is a, a, a problem for the investors and then some of them might require sector-specific or technology-specific policies with all the inefficiencies occurred by these policies. The lack of acceptance and the commodification of objection, carbon pricing and carbon markets are perceived as repugnant by some environmental groups. They are quite vocal in the public arena. And this is a reason why many policymakers also do not trust uh, that uh, in the end, carbon prices will be accepted. And the last point is the incomplete, the problem of incomplete international cooperation when one jurisdiction imposes a high carbon price. So there's the risk of carbon leakage and the loss of uh, competition. Now, nevertheless, this consensus uh, only partially reflects the reality. Here, this is one of the last uh, uh, numbers from the World Bank. And you can see over the last 30 years, we have, uh, we can observe uh, an increasing uh, uh, number of uh, carbon pricing schemes ranging from carbon taxes uh, to all sorts of emission trading scheme and hybrid systems. Currently, 22% of the global emissions are under a carbon pricing scheme and we have worldwide 61 uh, uh, um, uh, institutional settings uh, for the implementation. So in that sense, uh, over the last, since the 2000 years, we have seen remarkable implementation of that. Still uh, only 22% of the global emissions are under a, a carbon pricing regime. Now, let me explain a little bit, at least, from my observation, uh, Pigouvian taxation in the wild, the brief history in three acts. And here I would like to refer uh, to national policies and uh, in particular to the German case. I was in the last two years very much involved in the German debate uh, uh, to give uh, carbon pricing much more attention in our climate and energy policy. The second level was the EU climate policy, which uh, still uh, is one of the most important uh, uh, games in town, and in particular, the new implemented EU Green Deal uh, could provide, I would call this a Peguvian moment uh, for the transformation of the energy and the transport sector. And in my last, uh, uh, in my last section, I would like to refer to international climate policy and here particular to coal capital and cooperation and here I um, highlight an important aspect in the post-COVID situation. Uh, I will argue here that in the post-COVID situation, coal will become, or there's a risk that coal uh, will become even more important before, than before the COVID crisis. Now let me start with national policies, the German case. Now the German case was a quite interesting one because it, the, the main reason why Germany in the last two years has started to think about carbon pricing has a twofold reason. The first one was 
At one night, uh, German negotiators uh, at, in Brussels agreed on the so-called European effort sharing regulation. The European effort sharing regulation has imposed on each EU member states some kind of quantity targets. But in contrast uh, to the previous uh, negotiations or the previous results, um, when a member state cannot fulfill these quantity targets, it has to pay a penalty. So the risk to pay a penalty and a quite high penalty in combination with the Fridays for the Future on the street, the German government, the German Grand Coalition has to think about a redesign of the German uh, energy and climate policy, in particular in the so-called non-ETUS ETS sector, which consists of transport, heating and building. So what we did here is, and what you can see here is on the blue line, this is the carbon price and the growth rate of the carbon price, which would be needed to fulfill this European effort sharing regulation, roughly, with a lot of uncertainties. And uh, the German government, uh, in particular the Chancellor, announced that there is now a paradigm shift in Germany, that Germany wants to uh, move from regulation to direct carbon pricing. And then the cabinet has decided that uh, in 2021, there should be a 10 euros uh, per ton, uh, 10 euros per ton CO2, a carbon price out at the ETS. It should grow a little bit. And after 2025, uh, this national, this should be transformed into a national uh, emissions trading scheme in, as an upstream system, in particular for oil and gas, because coal is primarily dealt within the EU ETS. And after 2025, so in this emissions trading scheme, probably a price caller will be defined, but there should be then a trading scheme with uh, a price building mechanisms on, on, on the relatively free market. So this cabinet decision has been revised a little bit, so they will not start at 10 euros per ton CO2, but roughly about 25 euros per ton CO2 and end up in 2025 uh, with uh, 55 euros per ton CO2. But in order to fulfill uh, the European effort sharing regulation by 2030, there is a likelihood that in Germany we will see a carbon price above 100 euros per ton CO2. It seems to me that's a quite remarkable step, and I will also highlight a few of the main problems. One problem was distributional concerns. Germany has addressed this distributional concern. Uh, an equal per capita recycling has been rejected, but they have reduced the electricity prices and have increased the social transfers. And this made the, uh, the carbon pricing scheme less regressive and much more progressive. So you can see the equal per capita, it's a quite progressive scheme, just the reduction of electricity prices and social transfer uh, uh, basically reduces the regressivity, but we could do much better uh, with simpler uh, recycling schemes. So in the end, this was good enough uh, for the public acceptance and also for the majority in the, in the parliament. But still, there is a huge problem here. And the huge problem is that for the next few years, Germany will see a wide range of effective carbon pricing in the electricity sector, in the residential sector, and in the transport sector. And in particular, uh, I will show you then in a minute when the European Green Deal imposes an additional burden on transport and in the residential sector, this might even widen the effective carbon prices and the overall efficiency across the sectors. So therefore, this problem has not been addressed successfully, and it would require a large-scale uh, energy tax reform in the future, and also to address the different externalities in the transport sector. I will come to this in a minute. Now, there is a, the debate in the, in the public about the repugnant uh, markets and the mistrust about carbon pricing that it could not work or it is not uh, acceptable and it could even uh, destroy moral motivations. Here we have published uh, quite recently a study in Nature Sustainability together with Axel Ockenfels and Peter Werner. And here what we did is here um, we uh, conducted 
uh, uh, an experiment. Uh, in this experiment, we want to measure how model behavior interacts with pricing regimes, uh, in particular with direct pricing via taxation or cap and trade mechanisms. And it turns out that uh, uh, the, uh, the direct pricing scheme can incentivize voluntary abatement uh, activities in, in a much broader sense than the quantity-based mechanisms. And here you can see this in, in figure one. Here you have the auction mechanisms, and there is only a, a quite uh, a small amount of voluntary additional abatements where you have in the, the price mechanism. So then you have much higher voluntary contributions beyond what uh, profit maximization, maximization uh, would, uh, um, uh, would allow uh, the agents to do. And direct pricing increases voluntary abatement. And it is not true that the direct pricing destroys, so to say, moral motivations. The contrary is true. And the reason is quite simple, because in the auction mechanism, over time, people realize that when somebody is uh, undertaking voluntary this leads to a declining price, and the declining price basically leads to uh, emission increase uh, by other people, and in the end, uh, uh, this, uh, can, this both aspects cancel each other out. In the price mechanism, the price is stable, and then the voluntary abatement uh, pays off. So in that sense, uh, this is just an experiment, but it is interesting to see that now we see much more research uh, 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 try to figure out to what extent ex and, and to what extent incentives, economic incentives, can uh, strengthen a crowd in uh, moral behavior. Now, let me summarize this first part. The word is second best at best, of course, and there remains the problem of the uncertainty about the social costs of carbon. But there's a step, there are steps toward the solution, setting prices which are consistent with the quantitative quantity targets. This could also form some stable expectations for the investors. Distributional concerns not ideally resolved, no per capita recycling, but the reduction of the regressive uh, energy tax was a reasonable step in the right direction. Repugnant markets, this issue can be resolved by a price floor because a price floor mimics direct pricing. And admittedly, this is just one experiment, but uh, we need more experiments uh, showing or rejecting how direct pricing interacts with moral behavior or voluntary abatement. One important aspect remains the inefficient sector specific policies. Uh, Germany has formed a climate cabinet, so we have overcome the fragmented responsibilities of the ministries, but nevertheless, we see a wide range of effective carbon prices which are highly uh, inefficient. Is there a commitment device? To a certain extent, yes, we have a law on the national emissions trading scheme and in particular, we have the EU Green Deal, which basically uh, uh, creates a strong incentive, uh, or even uh, more than an incentive, almost an obligation, uh, to think in a new way about Peguvian pricing uh, in the EU member states, also in Germany. And let me explain this a little bit, uh, what are the scenarios here. And here I will argue uh, that the European Green Deal might create a Peguvian moment in, in Europe. Now, the European Green Deal is a, a very complicated animal, and here I would like to highlight only one aspect. And the aspect is that the EU Commission intends to tighten the emission targets uh, to 50 to 55 percent overall. Now, there are two basic scenarios available, and here I highlight the first scenario, and I call this the muddling through scenario. The modeling through scenario will be that the ETS sector remains uh, almost uh, untouched by this, uh, uh, by this uh, tightening of the emission target, but there will be uh, all the obligations has to be fulfilled in the non-ETS sector, in particular for buildings and, and transport. So then this would lead uh, to an emission reduction from 38% to almost 50% level compared compare to the 2005 level. 
So what, what will be the implication? The implication would be in particular for Germany, but all the other EU member states, we will see an even an increasing uh, a divergence of the effective uh, carbon prices across the sectors and then increasing inefficiencies. And here you can already see the effective carbon prices, not just for one country, but for the Europe as a whole. And we have a, a range almost for uh, zero effective carbon pricing for biomass uh, to 350 euros per ton CO2. And this range uh, would, be, uh, would be increased uh, by this scenario where basically every uh, all these additional emission reduction obligations will be fulfilled by the non-ETS sector. There's another, an, an additional comp complexity here, and this complexity is when we talk about tra the transport sector, it is not wise and it is not appropriate just to think about climate change. Within the transport sector, we are confronted and faced with multiple externalities, climate change, air pollution, congestion and accidents. And for these multiple externalities, you need multiple instruments to deal with these externalities. And this is something which makes uh, 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 carbon pricing in the transport sector even more complicated. In the EU, we have fuel taxes, standards and vehicle taxes. And of course, the fuel taxes, standards and vehicle taxes have a tendency to increase uh, the fuel economy. But there is a significant rebound effect, 5 to 30% of the energy savings are lost because consumers drive their efficient cars uh, more frequently. So uh, here we, we need uh, not just carbon pricing, uh, we have to think about the complementary policies like the technology standards, which are really vulnerable to significant uh, rebound effects, but also the reform of the other taxes, because all these taxes have nothing to do with the externalities uh, they are basically implemented due to, uh, uh, to, to the intent of the politicians to raise additional revenues. So there might be another uh, a quite uh, aggressive uh, or a, a, another uh, extreme scenario where nothing will happen in the non-ETS because of the high marginal abatement costs, but everything has to be done within the ETS. And here we have calculated what would be the implication for the carbon price the carbon price in the UETS will increase significantly uh, between 52 and, uh, and 75 uh, euros per, per ton CO2, which is, 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 is quite significant. This would lead to an accelerated coal phase out, not only in Germany, but also in the whole European Union. We will see higher carbon prices, but then uh, the debate on the border uh, adjustment mechanisms uh, will raise. Uh, some people might uh, argue for a compensation measure of the international offsets. But uh, this emphasizes again that uh, we need here a kind of a flexibility between the non-ETS sector in the ETS sector. And by and large, uh, I do not see another way um, that we have to integrate the ETS sector and the non-ETS sector at least gradually. And this I call a Pigubian moment because the inefficiency, the ambition in terms of, uh, of the target are so high and the potential inefficiencies because of the different carbon prices are so significant that it seems to me we have a Pigouvian moment that on the one hand, we can integrate ETS and non-ETS at least gradually. And at the same time, we might find a reasonable way to address the other externalities. So this is the current uh, uh, price of uh, CO2. So there was not a, a significant decline due to the COVID crisis. The market stability reserve did a good job in the short term, but the market stability reserve might destabilize the uh, allowance market in the long term, uh, at least. So we have some studies indicating this. And therefore, I would also argue that the UETS should be complemented by a direct pricing scheme, a minimum price, because this could stabilize the price and the expectation in the long run. So let me summarize here the EU. The EU is the archetypal second best institution and the uncertainty about the carbon prices can be addressed by a minimum price or by a price floor. It seems to me that would be a reasonable way forward. The distributional concerns require some kind of a coordination of the national energy tax reform. 
Otherwise, we cannot address the multiple externalities, and this needs some coordination also in Europe. Uh, the price flow can mimic the direct pricing and then to overcome uh, the problem of idiosync uh, idiosyncratic preferences of the member states when some member states, some individuals want to do more. The inefficient sector-specific policies, this remains, and an incremental integration of EU ETS and non-ETS seems to me uh, the right way to do. And I observe uh, an increasing uh, uh, an increasing awareness of the problem and also an increasing agreement that this could be a reasonable way to do a commitment device. Uh, that's a huge problem because there are a lot of uh, 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 the, the commitment device is not available and investors uh, have a hard time uh, to form stable expectations because what we understand now in the EU ETS, uh, investors and traders are quite sensitive to the announcement uh, of political measures and cooperation might be doable due to explicit and implicit transfers, uh, what you can observe in particular between Germany and Poland. So, so, so far so good. So this is uh, now the, this was the EU climate policy, but what you can see here is in the EU climate policy, uh, it's not just a very ambitious goal for 2030. The EU commission has announced uh, uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. This might be only an aspirational goal, but nevertheless, uh, it is quite important to understand uh, the importance of international cooperation. And I see basically the border uh, adjustment mechanism to debate about this, that now there's an, not only uh, the, the intention to uh, raise additional revenues, but also to take into account the problems of international climate policy. Now, what, what is carbon pricing on a global scale? It is probably not good enough to think about the number of uh, carbon pricing schemes. It is much more important to think about the effective carbon rate. And almost 50% of the global emissions uh, are not under a carbon pricing scheme. The effective carbon rate is zero. And only 10% of the emissions are roughly consistent with the two degree target. Uh, that's uh, you might say that's a, a, an encouraging message, but at least there is a, a lot of room uh, for improvement and a lot of room for work. Now, what happened during the Corona crisis, and I find this quite remarkable. So despite of the widespread lockdown, uh, the, re the emissions have been reduced, but only to a 2006 levels. And this is for me a quite clear indication that degrowth and such kind of things like a lockdown will never lead to a situation where we can reduce emissions in the long run. So this was a, a short shock. Uh, but what we can observe is that uh, the post-COVID-19 emissions will continue to rise unless there is no reliable policies in many parts uh, uh, of, uh, on, on, on the globe. And here you can see basically after the financial, the Asian financial crisis and even after the global financial crisis, there was uh, an, an after the recovery, uh, the emission trajectory remains almost the same. Now, what are the reasons why I believe that we are at least at risk that the emissions will rise after recovery again? And this has a lot to do with one issue, and this is the issue of coal. And let me explain this a little bit more in detail. Now, here you have um, the aspirational goals of the Paris Agreement, the two degree target and the 1.5 degree target. And what we can learn from climate physics and climate economics, every uh, temperature target can be translated into a global carbon budget. And of course, there is a lot of uncertainty about the global carbon budget, but roughly speaking, uh, this is here the uncertainty bar, 1,000 gigatons CO2 as a global carbon budget, a remaining carbon budget, which we can use uh, in order to, to, to limit the increase of global mean temperature around 2 degrees is a reasonable number. Again, there's a lot of uncertainty. The 1.5 uh, uh, budget is, 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 is even more ambitious. It's between, let's say, a little bit above 500 gigatons and here, uh, if you want to be on, on the safe side, only 200 gigatons. But 
if you basically calculate the cumulative emissions of all the infrastructure, uh, building, bridges, uh, without coal, so over the economic lifetime, the whole infrastructure will emit roughly a little bit less than 500 gigatons CO2. So this is, we are still committed to this emissions. Now, let me talk a little bit about coal. Here you have the coal-fired plants, which are operating under construction, planned and shelved. In China, in India, in the OECD countries and the rest of the world. And here I would like to highlight, these are not, is not only an issue of the large Asian countries like China and India. It's also an issue for the smaller countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Bangladesh and others. So, and here you can see basically that the operating coal-fired plants alone will basically uh, close the door for the 1.5 degree target. And if basically the shelved uh, coal-fired plant will come back into the pipeline, so then we are very close to absorb the majority uh, of the carbon budget, which is available uh, when we want to limit the increase of global mean temperature around two degree. And what we can see now currently is that the shelved um, uh, the shelved coal-fired plants come now back into the pipeline because many countries believe, rightly or wrongly, that uh, coal-fired plants have in a particular large fiscal multiplier. And due to this large fiscal multiplier, so then they might think investment in coal-fired plants are a good idea. But this speculation about the large fiscal uh, multiplier and the literature is, is very sparse about the extent of the fiscal multiplier for coal-fired plants. There's another issue which seems to me is much more important for the near-term future and in particular for the post-COVID situation. And this is the problem of the cost of capital in particular for the renewables. So what this, what this uh, graph shows is that this here you have the uh, the average capital costs, and you have the CO2 price. And the contour lines here show the expected share of renewables given a certain CO2 price and certain capital costs. And here you can see basically that, of course, in Germany, for example, the capital costs for P PV are quite small, but the capital costs for PV and wind uh, in Vietnam and India are quite high. So this clearly indicates that capital costs for renewables are much more important uh, than for the fossil fuel power plants because for the renewables, the upfront investments are much more important. The fixed costs are much more important. And here the vertical lines show the average capital costs for investments in renewables in selected countries and regions. So the capital costs affect the effectiveness of the carbon of the CO2 prices significantly. And in particular, in this high capital cost countries. So the carbon price is low. And in addition to this increasing capital costs, uh, the effectiveness of the carbon price uh, uh, is, 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 uh, will, will decrease. So in that sense, the cost of capital seems to me a very, very important problem. And this seems to me also in the midterm, the reason why many countries in particular in Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia uh, will rely uh, on coal and will continue to invest in coal. So this makes international cooperation uh, to a coal problem. And this is just a cluster analysis, but it seems to me, uh, despite of the technicalities of this uh, cluster analysis, it is a useful analysis because it shows uh, that we have oil and, oil and gas states. And with this, in this oil and gas states, the climate laws is, is, is very low, fossil fuel subsidies are high, oil and gas rents are high, uh, democracies are weak, corruption is high, trust is low, climate awareness is low. But oil and gas states are not the main problem. They only basically have 5% of the population and they are responsible for 6% of the emissions. But the coal development and the coal dependent countries, this is the most important problem because uh, they have uh, uh, 48 percent of the global population and 70 percent of the global emissions. So we have to deal with this coal problem with weak carbon, with low carbon prices and high capital costs. And uh, so from my point of view, I, I have chosen this map because it shows clearly how complicated, how demanding 
international uh, uh, cooperation will be. And for the next, uh, for the midterm and the short term, I would say climate policy is primarily uh, a coal problem. How could we do this? Uh, in, a, in a recent paper with my colleague uh, Ulrike Koenig, I have shown that conditional transfers uh, in combination with uh, a negotiation about carbon prices uh, could help uh, to increase international cooperation when countries are compensated for their mitigation costs, in particular when the mitigation costs are above uh, the global average. One way to do this could be an investment fund, and the investment fund could be used uh, to reduce the capital costs, uh, to provide credits below the, 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 the capital market interest rate in order to reduce the risk premium for countries like Bangladesh and incentivize them uh, to use uh, credits not for coal-fired plants, but for renewables. But uh, then they have to implement a reasonable climate policy. That's uh, a very complicated process, but nevertheless, it is worthwhile for the EU to think how they can enhance international cooperation. Otherwise, uh, I'm afraid uh, that uh, we will not be successful uh, in reduce the global emissions. And uh, uh, I think a paradigm shift in, is needed in international climate policy. Even international climate policy should uh, focus much more on carbon pricing instead of uh, negotiating uh, voluntary contributions. And uh, in the recent uh, European Economic Review, I published a paper together with Ulrike Konek showing this a little bit more in detail. So coal is a burden on the global carbon budget, as is the expansion of the infrastructure. The high cost of capital prevents the expansion of renewable energies and favors coal-fired plants. And international cooperation is needed. And if designed properly, hopefully possible. And here, as economists, we have to play an important role. Now, what are the challenges ahead of us? We have to deal with the uncertainty about the carbon prices. And a step forward, a step towards a solution would be, from my point of view, rule-based adaptive learning processes, where people can understand there's a long-term quantity target and we adapt the pricing to this. But in addition to that, it seems to me it is important that we not just talk about carbon prices and the risk-free premium. We should think about uh, the risk premium. That's a quite important aspect of the whole debate, including in the whole carbon pricing debate, risk premiums and capital asset price models to calculate this risk premium for uh, uh, abatement policies, but also for climate damages in a much more reasonable way. The uncertainty about the price elasticities are huge, but nevertheless, here you can see a carbon price dependent on, on this uh, target in the non-ETS. It's a huge range, but uh, so there is some convergence across models and across econometric studies. And it seems to me uh, with such an adaptive rule-based learning process, uh, we might iterate and this could improve uh, the policy making significantly. The second aspect, which is quite important, is horizontal equity. Uh, horizontal equity has been ignored uh, in the public policy debate, but also uh, in the debate within public finance. Here, my feeling is we need better models because, for example, overcoming the rural urban divide is a quite important thing. And if horizontal equity is an important, then just the equal per capita recycling is not good enough. And here I would like to refer uh, to a result of one of our papers when households have different capabilities to transform their energy use or their energy demand into reasonable energy use. So then you have energy intensive households and energy efficient households, households who can deal with this much more efficient than others. And then transfers uh, have to depend not just on income, but also on the capability to, to deal with households and to improve energy efficiency. Uh, policymakers in public debates concentrate more on horizontal effects and hardship cases. And it, a research is needed on optimal policy divine, uh, design on differentiated transfers taxes or non-linear taxes with horizontal heterogeneity. Incentives and moral behaviors crowding out 
uh, the crowding in of intrinsic motivation seems to me in times of Fridays for the Future will play in, uh, a, a more important role. And it might be useful uh, to show that uh, Peguvian pricing and Peguvian taxation crowds in intrinsic motivations and does not crowd it out. Inefficient sector specific policies for the European scale, the integration of uh, trading schemes, national tax reform, and the reform of complementary policies seems to me important. And these huge inefficiencies which can observe in Europe might create a Peguvian moment. Commitment device, why not think about an independent European carbon bank? A cooperation, conditional transfers, negotiation on carbon prices at an international scale in order to give the international climate policy a new push, new insights and fresh ideas. And of course, political economy, we have to think about compensation schemes because of concentrated costs and benefits versus the dispersed, uh, dispersed costs and benefits. Now, let me conclude. So what I would like to communicate this uh, in this keynote is Pigou is alive. Uh, there might be a consensus that there are a lot of practical problems for the implementation of Pigou, but uh, there are indeed thorny problems casting doubt on the political feasibility of the Peguvian taxation, but the consensus unjustly disregards the political success of the later, and we can build on these political successes. Today, 100 years after the publication of Pigou's Opus Magnum, we see remarkable success stories even under second best conditions. There might be a Peguvian moment within the EU because of its ambitious targets and the high inefficiencies. And my last comment is we economists can help significantly to enhance the implementation of this idea. We have to provide more sophisticated research which goes beyond the obvious. Uh, and uh, I think sometimes we should listen to the problems of the policymakers, but at the same time, we should tell the policymakers uh, what, what a marvelous idea it is uh, to implement Peguvian prices and taxes. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Uh, I think this was a fantastic keynote to get us started here because it was so comprehensive. Uh, it uh, really brought together recent research results and policy questions. Uh, and it was also optimistic. A lot of uh, talk about climate change is uh, uh, we need international cooperation, which is difficult to achieve. And I think this keynote lecture is really uh, talked about how it can be done, which is great. So we have uh, roughly 20 minutes for, for discussion. I would like to, so first of all, if I, if I see this correctly, um, partici all participants are invited to ask questions, uh, but this um, needs to be done through the chat. So uh, I would invite everybody to write questions into the chat uh, and uh, we would then pass them on uh, to Professor Edenhofer. I would like to start out with a question of, of understanding. You mentioned that uh, a lot of governments, if I understand correctly, consider coal as having a large fiscal multiplier. Uh, do you mean by that it's considered as a cheap source of energy uh, uh, if we abstract from the environmental costs because the capital cost is higher? Or uh, what does that mean, a large fiscal uh, multiplier? Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, now it is it is meant, so to say, what what macroeconomists perceive as a fiscal multiplier. You create a, a fiscal multiplier larger than one. So if you invest in a coal-fired plant, you can create a lot more. So you get more than one euros, um, one euro when 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 you do this in in, in the macroeconomic term, in the macroeconomic okay. sense, the high fiscal multiplier. So they perceive this. And it's, it's not an efficiency argument, it's an, an argument about designing rescue packages. Ah, okay. And that's because we, they build, we build factories. And, exactly. Uh, oh, why is yeah. that? Okay. So uh, it's, a, it's a Keynesian argument, not an efficiency okay. argument. Uh, okay. Uh, let me maybe directly add one other question. So uh, you discussed this question of how, how we can get people to cooperate. And you said, why not set up a fund, if I understand correctly, in the EU? 
Uh, so that's that's one option. Uh, another widely discussed option is this idea of climate clubs, uh, for instance, uh, telling countries, OK, if you want to do trade with the EU, uh, you need to uh, uh, you, you need to have a carbon price yeah. or you need to adhere to certain standards. Uh, so how does that idea fit in here? Do you think it shouldn't be pursued or it has less potential or is it complementary? Yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical about this idea of, of carbon clubs because in the end you have a you need a carbon tariff and most of the models, in particular the Nordhaus model on this, uh, um, excludes one important aspect and this is retaliation. And, uh, and, 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 and I don't like uh, the idea that climate policy as a, as a global public good problem is then embedded in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a scenario of trade wars and such kind of things. So it might be a threat, but I, I, I would like to, to embed the whole thing more in free trade and more in, in international cooperation instead of imposing a, a carbon tariff on, on other countries. And there are a lot of practical problems for this uh, border tax adjustment. So I would say yes, in in some in some exceptional cases, for uh, when when you have an energy intensive sector which is exposed to to international uh, competition, that might be an option. But but I think it is much more important to to uh, to enhance international cooperation than to start with uh, with with tariffs and and risk retaliation and and trade wars. Right. And, and if the EU started that, uh, as you say, you know, fund and helping countries, um, so would, I mean, the, the obvious objection would be, okay, the EU pays for it and everybody else watches. So there's another free rider problem here. Uh, so how could that be? Yeah. I, so the, the, the most important thing is I'm not talking just about the EU. I talk about international and I talk about conditional transfers, which is a taboo in the international uh, arena because uh, conditional transfers. So we, we so if if we provide such a thing, so then Bangladesh or these countries have to do something. They they should then implement the carbon price, and this is basically then to help them the carbon price. And then over time, uh, we ratchet up. We can ratchet up the carbon prices. So it's it's not just a free a free lunch. So they 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 have to do something, and they have to uh, in exchange to 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 provide increasing carbon prices. And we, we pay them a little bit of the capital costs. Right, right. So uh, let me say again, there is the, the opportunity to ask questions uh, over the chat, if I'm not mistaken. So all participants are invited to ask questions. I'm not sure I'm in the right chat here. Let me... Okay, yes, now, now I have it. So there is a number of questions. Let me get it started. Um, uh, okay, so here's a question from Ludger Schuhknecht. If you suggest a minimum price, why not also a maximum price? Uh, I think you did suggest both, did you? Or... Yes. Okay. I, I argue for a price caller. Okay. Um, so here is a question from Nazir Khan. Do you think countries like India uh, would be in a position to implement Pigovian taxes or a similar tax uh, regulatory program as European countries? Um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, so uh, India has a, a very small coal tax but there's here one, one, one problem, and uh, that, that's quite interesting. So the, 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 the power sector in India is very much dominated by, by the state. There is no, no market, there is no power market. And of course, uh, one of the biggest problems is that um, uh, this highly state-owned power markets, in particular in Asian countries, and, and, and what, in, in order to implement such a price scheme, needs also a, a, uh, um, a liberalization of, of, of the power markets. The interesting thing, uh, interesting case is now Vietnam. Vietnam last week has announced that they would like to phase out coal, and in, in conjunction with the phase out of coal, they would also like to reform the, the, the power market in, in Vietnam. 
So these are quite interesting signs. So probably we should focus a little bit more on the smaller Asian countries and not just on China and India, because in the smaller Asian countries, there are one billion people and, 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 and they, they, they can produce a lot of cumulative CO2 over the next uh, few decades. But, but there is some, there's some, some policy change here, which we can build on. Thank you. So here's a question by Eckhart Jan Neber. You highlighted the huge variance in CO2 prices across sectors. Uh, isn't this a first best perspective? And should we not focus instead uh, in our second best world more on those actors where political problems and uncertainties are less? Yeah, um, I, I agree. It's it's a it's a it's a first best uh, it's a first best perspective, uh, but. Um, the EU Commission and the EU, mem the EU member states have already decided uh, to, to be very ambitious in the transport sector, in the heating and the building sector. So, so this, is, this is not just a fantasy of a few economists. It's now basically written in law. And I think even, even in a second best scenario, think about the following scenario in the next few years. We might have a carbon price of 30 euros per ton CO2 in the UETS, and we could have a carbon price uh, in the other sectors above 100 euros per ton CO2. I don't think though this, this is a sustainable option. In one way or another, people will ask uh, to use this flexibility. And therefore, I would say uh, uh, this is a moment which we should use uh, for, an, for, an, for an integrated approach. And I think uh, uh, economists are very well advised to, to, to participate in, 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 in this debate. In general, I would say, yes, uh, it's, uh, in, in, this is a, from a second best perspective. There are some arguments to accept uh, some kind of sector specific policies. But I would argue we are already beyond that stage uh, because uh, we are so ambitious in targets that, that we really need uh, to capture this, uh, this efficiency potentials. Thank you. So another question by Florence Flues about information. So on the international cooperation on coal, in how far would you think it makes sense to offer low interest rate loans for renewable investment in developing countries without conditions at first, for instance, through international investment banks, to, just to have with the objective to have many countries joining in. And then at a later stage, one could add conditions for new, for additional loans. Would that make sense as a strategy? It might be, it might be worthwhile to think about, but uh, uh, and, and probably in the beginning is there is no choice to do it unconditional. But uh, I would uh, I would like to work hard that in the international arena uh, we can talk uh, in a few years from now on conditional transfers because we have a quite strange situation where basically we have the Green Climate Fund and the Green Climate Fund can only hand out unconditional transfers uh, and 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 the Green Climate Fund cannot uh, find sufficient projects currently it's a it's a very strange thing and 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 it is perceived by many countries as a machinery for redistribution. And I think that's not the right way to do. And uh, conditional transfer seems to me a very healthy thing. And uh, international cooperation always needs reciprocity. And if you want to have reciprocity, so then you say, I cooperate with you when you cooperate with me. And I increase the carbon price when you increase the carbon price. And when you tell me you are poorer than I am, and I can say, OK, I have a self-interest to, to provide you a transfer because increase the carbon price, uh, I also benefit from this. So th this kind of thinking seems to me uh, should be should be part of the international negotiations, but you might be right in the very beginning. So we have no choice because it's a taboo. But nevertheless, it seems to me it's worthwhile uh, to overcome this taboo. Uh, so so uh, a, a, a question related to that. So. Uh, how should we imagine this? Would this conditionality be one where one would write down the entire climate policy strategy for the country? I suppose it cannot just refer to one project because if they, you know, if they, they I, build I, a wind I, 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 I fully agree. So we should we should overcome the, the project based approach. I, I don't think this will work. So this is a complete bureaucratic monster. 
And we should not write down for the a, a country the whole strategy. We, we should say, okay, we give you this transfer, and please tell me uh, what, what kind of carbon price you want to implement. The carbon price is a nice thing because I can measure the effort. It's very transparent. In an international negotiation, we try to compare the voluntary contributions, right? Uh, some One country says, I, I will implement the feed-in tariff system. Another country says, I will reduce emissions uh, compared to a baseline. How, how, how can you compare such, such two policies? And, and, and the carbon price measures my effort and your effort. So, and, and this is something which is quite transparent and, and, and therefore this component of the carbon price could also create the reciprocity and, 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 and the transparency. Thing. So that's, that, would be, that would be, from my point of view, a, a quite reasonable way to, to move on. Oh, okay, but that would have to be a carbon price which really covers all sectors, right? Something we yeah. don't even have ourselves. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, but but here here I, I would be I would be pragmatic. So when coal is basically the power sector, and for many Asian countries, when coal is the most important problem, so then we have all the right to focus on the power sector. So okay. let's let's deal with the transport sector and the building and heating sector at a later stage. So the coal coal is the threat from my point of view. And, and we should focus now on coal and not on, on, on too many things at the same time. Right. Uh, so uh, here is a question by Andreas Feichel related to COVID. Would it make sense to use Bigobian taxes to finance the cost of the pandemic? I'm thinking, for instance, of, of taxing uh, super spreader events, uh, locations such as upper ski bars in Austria, churches and other mm -hmm. meeting places and in general places where there is little social distancing, high physical proximity. So the application of the Pigobian idea to uh, the pandemic. So uh, as long as you pay, you can uh, go to, to the bar and uh, uh, to, uh, does that make sense? At, at least, at least we should think about this. I think that's, that's a, I would say from a practical point of view, the, the, the problem is, uh, I, I have to think about this, but but the problem with, with Begubian taxation in, in such circumstances like uh, COVID is always the suspicion of many people, this is something like repugnant. Uh, you, you, you do something very immoral when you basically, uh, and it could be perceived then in the end as a fine. So I, I pay a fine, so to say, in order to, to be a super spreader, right? And this fine framework, uh, think about Michael Sandel. So this gives the whole thing a, a very, a, a very nasty thing. Uh, and 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 I I had a lot of discussions over the last few years with many many people. And I would say, with non-economists, this um, this idea that uh, economic incentives destroy intrinsic uh, motivations and, and moral behavior. This is a very strong, a very very strong belief. And and we should take this very seriously. And 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 uh, I, I like the idea of Andreas, but but nevertheless, so that's uh, that's something which needs might be an interesting paper to apply the the Pigubian idea on, on 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 COVID, but also taking into account this 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 moral motivations and and and, and moral framing. Okay, so uh, we've got three questions left here, and I'm afraid we uh, will be running out of time then. Uh, four, but then I'm afraid we'll have to close. So first, uh, Leonzio Rizzo, uh, what institution is giving the transfer? So about these transfers to other countries. What, uh, so I, I think you mentioned an institution, but maybe a few comments on that. And uh, where is the money coming from? Yeah, the, the institution which we have now is the Green Climate Fund. Uh, this is a, a, a body. The, the money comes from from the from the industrialized countries. Uh, it's basically about, uh, uh, it should be about 100 billion euros and uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not clear if all the countries have fulfilled the promises. Uh, but the problem of the Green Climate Fund is that the, the Green Climate Fund channels the money based on projects, on specific projects, and they have a hard time uh, to, 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 to evaluate uh, all these projects. and. Uh, for the Green Climate Fund, it would be a huge progress if the uh, Green Climate Fund would say, I, I give you this money, 
I give you this credit below the market interest rate, but then you have to implement the carbon price. So that's, uh, we are not there. We, we are, so this is very much project based. Uh, so for time reasons, I would suggest to take the last yeah. three questions together. Okay. Yeah, yeah let's do uh, that. The first is from uh, Ludger Schuknecht. So if you suggest a price a color or price corridor uh, for the carbon price, who is going to who is going to determine it? And what about lobbies and yellow vests who will want to influence this across the board for some types of emission? Can there be an automatism, some kind of automatic mm -hmm. rule? And related to that, the second question by Mireille Chiroulou Assouline. In France, carbon taxation has been massively rejected by the public, uh, which apparently prefers command and control policies and even to ban specific activities or products. Uh, do you think a price corridor? would be more acceptable i guess that's also related to what you said about the distributional questions and also beyond income inequality uh, and the third question what by bethany miller uh, bethany miller powell uh, what tools could be used for countries that export a lot of coal but have smaller emissions that is how to discourage em emissions at the source yeah, great questions. Uh, on, 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 the, on the price uh, caller um, from Ludger Schuknecht, a, a very good question. And, and also to give more an automatic uh, rule, I, I very much in favor of this. But I would like to emphasize, so we, we have already in the European Emissions Trading Scheme a kind of a mechanism, which is called the Market Stability Reserve. It's an incredibly complicated uh, mechanism to remove permits from the market. Uh, when there is an excess uh, on the market. And, and I would say this is so complicated, even for experts, uh, that investors cannot anticipate what the price effect of this, of this rule. And therefore, a price caller based on, on, an, on, on, a, on a quiet automatic rule, which, which, uh, which, which the, the policymakers have not too much flexibility, would be good. And I, I think it should be an independent authority. So something like the European Central Bank, uh, European Carbon Bank, managing this, this enormously uh, complex uh, entity like a European emissions trading scheme consisting of all sectors. It's worthwhile to, uh, uh, to, 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 to consider. Uh, in France, on, on the uh, price caller, I'm, I have some doubts, I would say, uh, from my German experience, this horizontal equity issue is incredibly important. Whenever I talk to people, this rural urban divide, this was, was, was important. And it seems to me uh, addressing uh, horizontal and vertical uh, distributional issues is, is essential. Without that, uh, we c policymakers cannot be convinced by efficiency arguments. So that this is my uh, my my conclusion after working for two years very closely with decision makers. So we have to address uh, the distributional, horizontal, and vertical issues. And countries on on export coal. That's a very complicated question because you refer here to production and consumption based emission accounting. I would prefer a situation where basically everything is based on production based accounting and uh, the CO two price is imposed on the source. Uh, all other uh, consumption-based uh, systems are incredibly complicated, but this can only be done uh, when basically uh, so some transfers are, are available and uh, designing the transfer scheme in a reasonable way is, 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 uh, seems to me is important. And in, in uh, this paper in the European Economic Revit, we have shown that uh, a well-designed transfer scheme can uh, enhance international cooperation significantly, but I assume uh, and I, uh, much more research is needed here. Thank you very much. Now we are slightly over time already, but it was uh, absolutely yeah. worth it. So this was really a fantastic lecture to start our Congress here. Thank you very much for that. Also for your very precise and informative answers to all those questions. So we appreciate this a lot. Thank you very much. Otmar Thank you.